pretty basic instruction course, and it is of use for people who have just finished their fellowships or uh, are planning to start a new fellowship after a period of work. And uh, those anti-segment people who uh, plan to expand into VR and uh, have a proper VR practice. So for this course, we have uh, mostly people in private practice. I am uh, practicing in Jaipur. Dr. Ajay Duzani joins us from Bombay. Uh, Dr. Ja Rajiv Jain joins us from Delhi. Dr. Swamil is again from Bombay. And Dr. Sachin Mahuli is uh, with us from Belgaon. Uh, before we start the actual instruction course, we have a guest from uh, Switzerland, Dr. Marion Monk. And she's going to talk to us about uh, the current status of OCT angiography in retina practice. I invite her to uh, give her talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Yes, my talk will step out a little bit, and uh, it's a, but, but it's a pleasure for me to be here today, and thank you very much for this kind invitation. All right, so this topic is rather broad, but I tried to put as much information as possible within 10 minutes. So there are, um, so far, seven manufacturers which um, provide um, OCTA models in their SDOCT devices. The mo most of them um, have uh, these OCTA models implemented in their S spectral domain OCT devices. However, there are two models from the size Flex Elite and the Top Country OCT, which also offer OCTA models in the SwebSource OCT devices. All of these different manufacturers use different methods to generate the flow motion contrast images. In respect to the time, I won't go into detail um, what, which kind of methods these are, but if you're interested, we can talk later on. And the main advantage of the OCTA is really that you can depict the individual um, retina, vascular, and cortical layers um, without, without using dye injection. So you're able to um, individually look at the superficial capillary plexus, the middle capillary plexus, the deep capillary plexus, and the core capillaries. And if you have a swept source OCT, you're also able to look at the choroid. As previously said, Every manufacturer used different methods to generate these flow motion contrast images, but they also use different segmentation lines. And this is rather a problem, especially when you want to compare the images among each others, um, because um, when you look at the images, you may see that you end up in uh, um, significant differences in the images. This is just another example which displays um, one patient actually um, from imaged by seven different devices. And especially when you look at the deep, deep capillary plexus, you see that when you look at the images that even the foveal avascular zone definitely does not look the same in each of the image. Each image modality has its limitations and has to cope with some of the limitation. And for OCTA, it's definitely motion artifacts and image artifacts. Usually the devices have an ill-built eye tracker, and if, you, um, if the patient makes small eye movements, um, the, uh, the device is possible to account for that. However, when you have big motion and big um, eye movements, it's not possible for the device to cope with it, and then you get these horizontal lines, which may impact your evaluation of, uh, of the image. Image artifacts, there are a couple of different imaging artifacts. The most important are projection artifacts, vascular doubling, or hyperreflective dots. And I think the more we look at these OCTA images, the more, the more image artifacts we see. Um, I will get into detail in some of the image artifacts later on in my talk. And in some, in some cases, we are also already able to account for these uh, image artifacts or projection artifacts by using dedicated software. Each device uses different scan patterns, so actually all the devices uh, provide a 3x3 three three and a 6x6 six six millimeter scan. Some of the devices also provide 8x8 eight eight and 9x9 nine nine millimeter scans. And the uh, uh, Flex Elite, size Flex Elite, um, also has a 12x12 12 12 and 15x9 um, scan pattern, which you can see here, which is, I think, very intriguing. The central scan patterns are usually high resolution, up to 10 micrometers per pixel, and you can really evaluate um, quantitative parameters. You can account for CNV, and these are used really to look at the center of the, of the image. When you have wide field images, you have a wider field of view, and of course, because you scan a wider area of the, of the retina, the resolution is not so high and can be up to 18 micrometers. Um, you can see some of these images right down here. The intriguing thing in these wide field images is um, you can do wide field montage images. So by, um, by performing five 12 by 12 scans, um, you can, uh, the device will montage it together and you really get then a wide field of view um, up to 100 to 110 degrees of the retina. 
Or another possibility is to do two 15 by nine scans and that's also automatically merged by the device and you get a wide field of view, um, similar as a Hallucina angiography. I previously talked about the projection artifacts. So when you look at the deep capillary plexus, you always have to account for these projection artifacts. You may think, okay, I know that, that I will see the vessels from above, so who cares about projection artifacts? But um, it really helps you to differentiate the lesions and to quantify changes in the deep capillary plexus. For example, when you look at this image here, it's a slab of the outer retinal and core capillaries. You may think, is there a CNV, is there no CNV? And when you do the projection artifact removal, you see that it looks completely different, and you can definitely see that there is no CNV lesion there. So projection artifact removal really helps us improve the visualization of CNV, and it allows the accurate evaluation of vessel density of the deep capillary plexus and also for CNV, because also in CNV, you will have uh, projection artifact removal and this, the CNV lesion which will look larger and the density will be higher com um, after before you do the projection artifact removal. And you also have to be aware where the projection artifact removal was used in the study you're reading because the uh, density rates may differ up to 50%. So the previous study which were published on vessel density in a deep capillary plexus always showed a vessel density about 48, 50%. And now we know that the vessel density is about 20, 25 to 30%. And of course, if you see the vessel from above, you might try to cover the extra vascular changes in the deeper layers. So we, we use the central scans also to do um, quantitative assessment of the OCT images. And uh, two of the main um, parameters to evaluate here is the vessel density, which evaluates the total length of the perfused vasculature, and the perfusion density, the total area of the perfused vasculature. However, you have to be aware that unfortunately these terms are not homogeneously used. So when you hear vessel density, you can't be sure that you're talking about the total length of the perfused vasculature, and you always have to go back and see um, what the definition was. And uh, these parameters are very intriguing because they very nicely correlate with the severity of diabetic retinopathy with ischemia in vasculitis and also ischemia in retinal vein occlusion. But we still have to figure out um, what real impact these parameters have on the long run and long term. This is just one representative example. And um, as you can recall the pictures I showed you before from the seven different images, you can assume that these vessel densities and these parameters really vary among the devices. Um, and uh, we really have to cope with these problems because now on and now on there are multi-center trials coming and we have OCTE as exploratory outcome parameter and we really don't know what to do with the data because they vary so much among the devices. Another quantitative parameter to evaluate is the foveal avascular zone in terms of the size, raw length, and circularity. And again here, due to the fact that you have different segmentation lines, um, these, uh, these metrics may differ among the devices. Another quantitative parameter which is often evaluated is the fractural dimension. It usually shows you the degree of complexity of biological structures, and it's usually decreased in diseased eyes. And further, quantitative parameters, uh, you can evaluate with OCTE the area of non-perfusion, the CNV area. There are various variables you can evaluate. So now I talked that there is a big difference among the devices. What about the reproducibility? So when I scan a patient and I scan it on another day, how reproducible are these data? So actually in terms of their foveal avascular zone metrics, the reproducibility is really high. Also in terms of the vessel density of the superficial capillary plexus, the, um, the, uh, the reproducibility is very good. The reproducibility is a little bit lower in terms of the vessel density of the deep capillary plexus. I apologize, um, I, have, I don't have a Mac and um, my presentation looked a little bit different when I prepared it, yeah. <laughs> All right, but you can also um, do quantitative and uh, quantitative assessments of the wide field images. And interestingly and uh, very intriguingly, these uh, parameters are very uh, repro reproducible in terms of the average vessel length, the elaconarity, and the total number of junctions. However, no matter how good your image quality is, and if you have a signal strength from seven or above, or and you have no imaging artifacts, no motion artifacts, you still have to consider cataract because your measurement, your quantitative measurement will be biased by cataract and will be falsely low, even, even if the image quality is perfect. You just have to be aware of that and make sure, or just at least have it in mind um, when you look at the images and when you evaluate them. So 
So in terms of their quantitative measurements, we can say that the inter-device comparison of the quantitative parameters may be quite challenging, at least right now, although some studies have reported good inter-device agreement. And the reproducibility of the measurements depends, among others, on the evaluated parameters and on the image quality. And as I still have a little bit of time, I want to go into detail a little bit on wide field OCTA images, because I think it's a very intriguing uh, modality. And for example, in all vascular retinal diseases, it's, it's, a, it's a nice way uh, to depict lesions. For example, in diabetic retinopathy, um, OCTA, wide field OCTA was shown to be, uh, to be as good as fluorescein angiography and definitely much better than the gold standard of seven, um, seven field images and uh, wide field color fundus images. For the detection of neurovascularization, it's also very useful because sometimes on FA you may have a hypofluorescent lesion and you're not, not, not sure, is it, a, is it a IRMA, is it already a, a neurovascularization? It won't pop up like a neurovascularization itself. And if you do then the OCTA, it, it can be identified as a, as a neurovascularization or you say, okay, there is nothing. But you can definitely see whether there is something here or not. Okay. Um, and it's definitely better than the ultra wide field color fundus imaging in detecting neurosclerization on the disc and elsewhere. It's also very intriguing for the evaluation of uveitis patients, for example, in birdshot. You can follow the disease progression. This was a patient just recently diagnosed with birdshot. You see the cordial lesions here, but you see that the core capillaries is still not involved. And so you can follow the patient. You can all also follow um, uh, uh, treatment response, for example, in VTH. You see all, all these granulomatous lesion blocking here. Um, Ten days after glucocorticoid treatments and two months of glucocorticoid treatments, the lesions are completely gone. So I think, in the end, OCT is a new valuable image modality that allows non-invasive high-resolution display of individual retinal layers. However, we have to cope with different segmentation alignments and algorithms. And of course, there's an inconsistent nomenclature and we have a limited compar comparability in terms of the quantitative measurements. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a question for you. You had this study where you compared uh, the seven different OCT angiography devices in the yes. same patient. Uh, did you also uh, compare the same thing uh, using a standard Fluorescein angiography or yeah, um, yeah. OCT? No, no, not OCT, the fluorescein angiography. No, no. So is there any study which compares the fluorescein angiography with, uh, with the uh, OCT? With OCTs, angiography? yes, it does. And what we see is, for example, in, um, in the fluorescein angiography, we can only depict the super, uh, superficial capillary plexus, whereas, for example, in the, um, in the um, OCTA, we see the, um, we see the deep capillary plexus. But usually from the, first, from the initial studies, which compared the devices, we also used FA, um, because for us it was gold standard to define the foveal aperture zone, for example. Okay. Yeah. No, so the, my, my question was that uh, if you use the OCT angiography for uh, visualizing the uh, superior uh, the, the superficial capillary yes. plexus. Ha, uh, have you uh, any study that compares the uh, performance of these seven angiogram, uh, angiography machines, the fluorescent angiography machine, versus yes. the fluorescent angiography? So, which is the uh, best? Which has the best correlation among? Uh, unfortunately, the not. But that's a good point. Yeah, unfortunately, not. So we can't afford this machine in India. So, so should we wait for the technology to improve? Will it get cheaper? What is the future? You and you anticipate, I want to know. So th this is definitely a problem, I know, but I know a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, um, practices already have it, um, um, but nowadays it's still very expensive. I, I totally agree. But um, there, are, um, um, there are a couple of manufacturers which, um, which provide an add-on software version, so if you have the latest OCT, you can upgrade it and can use it, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you so much. So after this nice talk on OCT angiography, we'll move on to the uh, IC, that is setting up a mm -hmm. VR practice. Uh, a lot of us uh, have finished our fellowship or have been working elsewhere, and then we decide to uh, open shop. We decide to start our own practice. And because not all, all of us are born with a silver spoon, like these gentlemen, or this gentleman. So we have to plan our finances much better and we have to make sure that for every uh, rupee that we spend, we get the maximum possible return. 
So new step is usually a, a huge decision and it has a lot of implications both and the way you plan your uh, clinic or uh, any equipment for that matter has implications on the way your practice is going to develop and uh, how comfortable you are going to be. So the first step in thinking about uh, setting up a new uh, uh, setting up a new clinic or an institute or uh, any institution or any machine is to decide the scope of your setup and the role of the equipment that you plan to buy. Whether it's going to be a uh, OPD setup, do you think you are going to have a surgical suite? Are you going to uh, set up a primary center or a peripheral referral center that uh, feeds on to your uh, major surgical center? Does your equipment have to be mobile or is it fixed it's going to be in one location? Uh, do you want to start the setup full on with all the equipment from the day one or do you have you planned to incrementally increase the number of uh, devices that you have, instruments that you have? And of course, uh, you have to uh, pay attention to the clientage that you have or what you have in mind. And then comes the budget that is available. So first impressions uh, have a very lasting impact on the patient psyche and on the conversion of patients for procedures. So you have to set aside a certain amount for interiors. If your place is rented, I would not uh, go over the top, but if it is your own place, then you can spend a little more on interiors because it's going to be lasting and it's going to be there for a long time. Always seek professional help when designing uh, because they can use spaces more, they can uh, make the place much more functional than we can. And plan beforehand for future purposes. Always reserve some space for future expansion because all uh, clinics, all hospitals grow. CCTVs are a must because in today's uh, medical legally very volatile uh, climate that we live in, it is always better to have a good CCTV and preferably in key places with audio recording and uh, that is what we have. Choose your instruments wisely. Uh, the instruments have to be chosen according to the site. If it is a premium setup, you cannot go with basic instruments. The example that I've given is that if, if you if you cannot have a trinetra or a remedio type of a fundus camera when you are projecting yourself as a referral institute. If it is a peripheral referral center, a fundus on phone type of a device may suffice. Whereas if you are uh, treating primarily at one particular center, then you may have to have a better equipment. Academic versus commercial. If you are interested in academics to a significant extent, then you need to have good quality uh, instruments, otherwise you will end up frustrated. If the volume is low, then you should try to limit your uh, expenditure. If the volume is high, then usually uh, you can go for costly equipment. What you have to define early on in your practice, what is essential and what is luxury. To give you an example, a single spot laser is an essential thing. A multi-spot laser is a luxury. Same way, a time domain OCT is no longer a luxury now, it is an essential thing, but a SERP source is a definite luxury. In the operating room is where the maximum stress is. You have the maximum uh, stressful time in your day in your OR. So let it be a more comfortable zone, spend more on the OR. So once you, uh, the first step is that you generate a generic equipment list. I want a laser, I want a microscope, I want a uh, non-contact system. The first thing is generate a generic equipment list. In front of that, mention the options under each heading. So what are the options that you uh, have? How do you choose those options? Generally, it's best to keep three or four options, not more than that. Uh, the strength versus weakness of every particular option has to be listed. The first and foremost thing is, is it going to have an impact on therapy? If it improves your quality, the, uh, that particular option gets a higher uh, rank. Does it improve your comfort and the patient comfort? Another important uh, factor in uh, our times is that does that particular equipment reduce your reliance on assistance? So if you have a non-contact system, you probably don't need a very reliable assistant to hold on to the contact lens on the cornea. So choose wisely. The maintenance issues and recurring costs come next because they are also important considerations. And then come the cost differences. So it's not always just the cost of the machine which decides whether you're going to buy one particular uh, option over the other. Always, 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 if you've worked on that particular system, fine. Otherwise, always take demos because you don't know where and what problem it's going to create in your particular setup and in your hands. Now, a case in point is you always may not uh, have this kind of a setup where you have a Lumera microscope and a, a Dork EVA machine, the highest end uh, system, but things can be managed at a much cheaper uh, scale also. This is a disposable biome which comes at less than one-tenth of the cost of a, of a biome and it gives you the same quality. Same way, a foot plate of a biome which if you buy the original one on the left hand side, it costs you nearly 1.25 lakhs. Get it made in India, we've got very good manufacturers that make the exact same thing at less than one-fifth of the cost. 
So always list out your options and then choose. Once you're well versed with the available options, then you rank them by preference. Again, the, its role and its impact on results is very important. If it is a primary machine, that is the one that you're going to use all the time, let it be a better machine. Otherwise, uh, you can have a second-hand equipment or a lesser a machine with lesser capabilities as your backup. If you're going to use the machine very frequently, then it should be on a, of a higher order because that is going to improve your comfort and performance. The cost of use and maintenance also needs to be calculated depending upon the volume that you are expecting. And uh, there are certain instruments that have a very high return on investment. The, the ones that you use very frequently have good ROI. However, there are certain instruments that have a low ROI. For example, in today's time, a fundus camera has a very low return on investment because you use it in lesser and lesser number of cases. But it is an essential thing that you need to have in your practice. So here, you can choose an option which has slightly lesser features and is cheaper rather than going for a highest end because you're going to use it much less uh, times. Always never ask for the quotation from the company before negotiation. Always negotiate first then ask for a quotation and then again start your negotiation round because then you have a lot of leeway, you can bring down the prices further. A very good option is to consider second-hand equipment. Now second-hand equipment does not always equate to bad equipment. How do you decide whether you're going to go for new equipment or, uh, or uh, uh, second-hand equipment? If your, uh, if your role of equipment is to be the primary equipment or it is a diagnostic equipment on the basis of which you're going to take treatment decisions, you probably are better off going for newer equipment. Anything that is computer-based, has a lot of computing power required or a software upgrades, it is always better to go for new equipment. Things that have more lenses, more mechanical parts, you can very well go for second-hand equipment because these do not degrade with time. Where the technology has changed, for example, between Stratus and Cirrus, time domain to uh, spectral domain, you should always go for a higher end technology because otherwise you would be forced to change very soon and that is going to be an additional expenditure. So the way we take decisions when we are planning to go for a second hand equipment is that first take the technical decision, the, the, the technology decision, then comes the volume decision, how frequently you're going to use it and in how many patients. Are you going to use that machine for marketing? For example, our anti-segment colleagues use the Femto cataract for a marketing purpose. So obviously, things that you are going to use for marketing as your USP cannot be second-hand. You have to have them new. And then comes the risk decision. By risk decision, I mean, whenever you are considering buying a second-hand equipment, do consider the cost of the parts of the machine that need to be replaced. If the cost is very high, for example, in lasers, if the laser uh, cavity cost is very high, and uh, you cannot, you, if you have to replace it, you're probably going to be, uh, it's going to come as good as buying a new machine, then better buy a new machine rather than going for an old system. So look at the individual cost uh, of the individual components that need to be replaced. So what do you look for? Whenever you buy a second hand thing, there are certain commandments that you need to follow, otherwise you'll end up in soup. Always deal with reliable players, especially get references from people who have bought machines earlier. Always hire a technician, not the vendor, a technician whom you rely, independent guy who, to trust, uh, uh, who, who you trust to inspect the system. Research the equipment service history. All equipment has serial numbers. So you take the serial number, get the service history of that particular second-hand equipment from the company, and you'll know exactly what has happened and when it has happened to the equipment. Buy the latest model you, have, uh, you can afford. Even among second-hand equipment, there are different models available. So among them, always buy the latest model you can afford, but also spend time to look on the individual components. If you have a 15-year-old laser, but the laser cavity has been uh, replaced recently, then it's almost as good as a new laser. So uh, spend time on the components. If you're going for refurbished, factory refurbished, for example, Zeiss sells uh, factory refurbished OCTs, always ask the details of the refurbishing process Get a list of all that has been done. If they have refurbished a particular part, but not a critical part, then you are in for trouble. For example, uh, if the spectrometer of an OCT has not been replaced, and you're buying an old OCT, then you're in for trouble because that costs almost six to seven lakhs. If they've just replaced a galvanometer which costs uh, maybe 50 to 75,000, then it's not much of a refurbishing that has happened, okay? So get the list of all the components that have been replaced and when, so you will be, uh, you, you'll know exactly how the machine is going to perform. Get the facts on warranty and serviceability. By this I mean that whatever uh, vendor you are going to buy the second hand machine off, ask them whether they are going to take that machine into warranty. I may, for example, buy a NIDEC OCT from somebody else, but I will call up the NIDEC guys to ask them whether 
this machine can be now put under warranty with them. So then it can be taken care of. Also, in second hand equipment, always ensure from the company that the spare parts would be available for the next at least five years. If it is not so, then you are in for trouble. Let's suppose you've bought new things. Is that the best thing? You still have to be careful. Be very specific about the model and features in your purchase order. Write down everything that has been negotiated very well in the purchase order, every single thing. Otherwise, the company has a tendency to go back on them and keep a copy. A lot of us give the purchase order to the company. We don't have a copy of it. And uh, then the company says, you, you didn't try that. Check the invoice that is received. How do you check the invoice? You physically inspect the equipment. You counter check your serial numbers with the invoice. You inspect the equipment for physical damage and the functioning. It takes about five to 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes, but it is worth doing all this. Always ask the service engineer to show you the service and the shipping record of the new equipment also, because everything nowadays is done with the management systems that have everything detailed. Every single moment of the machine is detailed. Always ask the service engineer to give you the admin password of your de devices. For example, if you want to get your device checked by a third party and he does not have the admin password, he cannot make uh, any sense. He cannot uh, go into the machine software to find out any details about the machine. So get the admin passwords also. And check all the conditions in the CMC and AMC. Uh, example, small example I would give here is that uh, a lot of companies void the CMC of a particular uh, electronic device if the earthing or the electrical connection is not up to standard. Now, whenever you're getting an engineer to install the machine, ask him to check it and certify whether the point on which he has put the machine is all right or not. If it is not all right, get it corrected before you install the machine and start using it. Otherwise, three months later, just three months after a new machine is bought, they may ask you to change a very important, a very costly component and you would not be left with any choice. So all the time be alert. This is the second last slide. Uh, be very, uh, negotiation is a very important tactic in reducing the prices and getting the best. Always, uh, one thing that you have to remember is medical equipment has very high profit margins. So what can you can do is that confirm from there are certain websites where you can get the landing price in India of every single equipment. So look at that and then start the negotiation process. Talk to reliable colleagues on what they have bought the, price, uh, the uh, machines at. Pitch competitors head to head. Try inviting both the vendors on the same day at the same time and meet them. They will lower the uh, prices much more than they would when they meet you individually. Try fixing the rate in INR. The international market is fluctuate, uh, fluctuates quite a bit and sometimes uh, lakhs of rupees can be lost in the conversion rate. Bargain hard and be patient. Never show the company that you're impatient and you want the equipment very fast because that just uh, totally closes your door for negotiation. And always push for additional CMC. It is the machine, if you're buying a new equipment, it is the company's responsibility for it to function for a reasonable length of time. And they do give additional CMC if you are a little pushy. Be shameless in negotiation. They are. Okay, so I'll conclude with the slides. The do's and don'ts when buying equipment is make a research list, drive a hard bargain, always read the fine print of all the conditions, consider buying secondhand or pre-owned equipment, be alert during the installation process, do not compromise on the results of your uh, treatment just because you bought a cheaper machine. Do not be rigid. Look at different alternatives. You have much cheaper and uh, different alternatives available. Do not overreach. Don't try to uh, you know, buy everything at the single go. You can plan it in advance. Don't deal with shady vendors and don't just chase the price. You may have to buy a costly equipment if it really impacts your treatments and makes your life comfortable. Thank you. I'd like to invite Dr. Ajay Durrani for his talk now. Yeah. Any questions for Dr. Abhishek? I think it was a very crisp presentation. Yeah, please, please ask. Chris, where exactly can you check the landing price? Okay, so there's a website called zoba.com, Z-A-U-B-A. -A. And again, there are several custom, uh, there are websites that uh, list the uh, customs data. So you can have the price, the, the price is always there. For every single machine that lands in India, the price is there. And you can add another 35% to that for the duties and maybe 15 to 20% for the company's margin. So that should be a reasonable price. So you, you can, you start from that price point. Don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, most companies have a tendency to quote the prices almost 30 to 40% higher than what they will eventually give you at. Okay. I'd like to thank Dr. Abhishek for this opportunity. I'll be speaking on casting a wide net 
interacting with the anterior segment colleagues for building up a VR practice. So a new retinal specialist is already a very mature and experienced clinician able to handle the clinical challenges. But some challenges don't have to do anything with the retina and the residency and the fellowship that you've done and a good deal to do with business. For example, marketing, it's a challenging, it's a challenging but a necessary task that we practitioners much must learn and address. The earlier you learn, the better it is. Yet our schools and residencies and fellowships hardly do anything and they don't prepare us for it. We just prepare us on core science. So these are a few retinal surgeon rules which we should follow if you want to be a successful and get more references. First thing is that the cataract surgeon is always right. If you feel he is uh, whatever, please see rule number one, okay? Because he is your annadatta to put it differently. All lens drops in his case only occur in posterior polar cases, yeah? Either they know it before or they realize it later, it doesn't matter. And it's always just one one-fourth or one-eighth of the piece of the nucleus is inside, though the whole nucleus might be inside, doesn't matter, you know. But he's always again right, so you just fished out only one-eighth of a nucleus piece. And always the next second day, third day, there's just little more iritis, and you know, it's just always iritis only, it doesn't go ever beyond that. So again, he's right, it can be TAS, you know, that dangerous E word is never mentioned, you know. So you have to, you know, subtly put it, you know, that maybe it is that, you know. So let's give an antibiotic with steroids that way. And it's usually just some vitreous strands are there in the AC when you feel that there is, you know, you know what will be there inside the AC. And preoperatively the fundus was normal, I saw him. And uh, after the block, the eye was uh, just a little soft, everything was okay, the surgery went perfect when there's a perforation. So let's be get back to this uh, marketing business. So marketing moves your practice in a desired direction that may increase your, include increasing the income, deterring new competitors, retaining your market share, introducing new services, and combating negative publicity. So how should you market? So you know, you should basically, how do you develop a referral base? Develop a database of your referral network based on the geography in and around your area, because the traffic is so bad in every city nowadays that you know, you can, your close by colleagues can only refer you. Include the name and the addresses of every potential connection within the given radius of your practice. Once you've put a list together, plan to introduce yourself to as many as colleagues as you can. Ask them about what patients they like to see and what is their expertise and what you see so that you could have a, you know, a mutually benefiting symbiotic relationship with them. Most important, make yourself always available, you know, on the cell phone, pick up his phone any time and any, anywhere, you know. So you should be very accessible, there should be no barriers to your accessibility. Make it easy for the other practices or practitioners to call you <clears throat> and when they want to refer the patients. So your staff is the first person who interacts with them. So you have a very, you know, uh, a very good staff who is very good in maintaining relationships and developing them. So your staff has to tell them, sure we can see him and let's see how early we can set it up. That should be the answer. Not that, you know, I'll call you back and maybe after two days or three days, you know, because if he's called you up, I think he knows it's the priority for that patient. And always communicate back to your referring doctor. He needs to know what that patient had. So please, if you can't call him up, send him a letter and tell the patient that he has to go back to him because he's the primary surgeon. So refer the patient right after the patient's visit. You call up the doctor and tell him why and what. Maybe if he's sitting on your chair, you can call him up and, you know, you can develop a better rapport. The doctor will want to know everything that's going on with his patient. It's his patient and he would also be ready to speak to him when he comes back to him, knowledgeably, you know. So create a referral, schedule the appointment, review and submit the report to the referring doctor. Now whenever you, 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 you either give your card to your colleague or your doctor or your, or your patient, the first thing nowadays they do is just they Google your name or your center. So you should be very visible on the internet, that's very important. Along with the practice address, maps and description is very important. So uh, having a strong online presence in today's day and age, I think they judge you more by your online presence than I think your capabilities or anything else. The more swanky your website, no, I think the patients get more impressed, at least the, the millennials and the new generation individuals. So availability, 
affability and ability. I think ability we all have. We all are fellowship trained. The first two, availability, as I told you, you should see patients and referrals as soon as possible. Try to maintain your time schedule in the OPD. Make sure that everybody who interacts with you is friendly, pleasant. Address the patient by his name. Try to engage him in a light conversation, even if he has an endophthalmitis. Patients might all perceive a higher ability in physicians who have affiliations with academic publications or you know ap academic colleges, medical colleges. So try to publish. So mm -hmm. practical tips is when you start your practice, you might go to your cataract friends clinic and see patients there, mm -hmm. do his OPD and OP OT there. But as you grow, you can you know increase your uh, acquisitions like you acquire a new OCT, new laser, constellation, recite. I think the bottom line, if one point you ask me is what is important is always be humble to the doctors and the patients. The referring doctor is always right and he never refers late. Okay? So you're the captain of your starship if you're in you know, a solo practitioner. So you have to take credit, you can have to also absorb the blame. So if you have a positive attitude, you can create your own team with it. Do charity work at your place rather than referring them out. So building a patient base is very important. Find a niche, something that you know uh, you have a passion for, like CSR or OCT or whatever, you know, and try to get more into it and you know publish on that. So in private practice, patient satisfaction is very important. Not only when you treat, but you have to understand their other worries and fears and anxieties. Robust carrier tips, which I'll give you all a few, is that always focus on what is best for your patients, what you would want to do for your parents, see that you do for your patients. If you're true to them, this will help you more than anything else. And that's the best marketing, you know. Take extra care and time for the referred patients. So this is what uh, doctor's duties are like. As I'm a professor, I always ask my students, so what is the duty of a doctor? So, you know, so this is what described in Harrison. Primum non nocere means first do no harm to your patients. You can treat often, cure sometimes, but the last thing is you can comfort always without any knowledge also. So comforting doesn't cost you or, you know, requires knowledge. So I think if you have a, you know, a, 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 like a rounded private practice, you can have family, personal time, and also academic time. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ajirudani. I'd like to invite Dr. Samil uh, Shet uh, to talk, uh, to give his talk on the topic of whether you should stick to only retina practice or you should uh, be doing other things also, other things ophthalmology. Uh, no, I think this topic has been given to me because uh, I do retina obviously, but I also do cataracts. I have my own LASIK machine and I still manage to have a decent referral base. Probably that's why they've given me this. So retina practice versus comprehensive practice. Basically what I'm asked is whether I should be, whether one should be the jack of all trades, which is comprehensive ophthal, should do everything, or master of one, one trick pony pertaining to retina. So let us put the latter. Let us see if you are retina, retina, retina all the way, what happens. So retina has definitely come a long way. We had a lot of opening up the eye, 20 gauge suturing incisions, which has now become really slim, 27 gauge sutureless surgeries, which can be finished quite quickly with the 5,000 cuts per minute. Retina has come a long way from a direct ophthalmoscope to enhanced depth imaging of OCT and aura to aura imaging as you see in the opters. Retina has come a long way from loss of vision of 15 letters. All, all we used to tell them is you will not lose vision. Now it has come to best visual equity gain of more than three lines. So retina is result oriented and can be pursued as a speciality. We used to have general surgery MS and then used to have MCH and then fellowships further as super specializations. In ophthal, we still have retina as a fellowship, but in the near future it will be such that it will become an MCH field and we'll have further fellowships diversifying out of retina such as vascular, macula, pediatric and so on. So definitely you are a specialist and it gives you that satisfaction because whenever you're rescuing a colleague's nucleus, you're also rescuing his reputation. You have a good referral base on account of that. The important thing is you're not seeing khujli panis in your OPD day in and day out. 
you're seeing those select patients whom you're going to give more attention to, which is the field that you specialized in. There is proper division of labor because of which you have immense job satisfaction as what Dr. Dudani mentioned. You can research, you can innovate, you can raise the bar in your field and let's say satisfy the academic kida. But come to reality, this is a very, very idealistic picture that I've painted. In reality, it is not what all seems. So if you are all retina, 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 definitely the equipment costs keep, keep rising, escalating. You have the 3D OCT, then you have the swept source OCT, and now you have the angio OCT. This is just one piece of equipment where you keep spending. And you always have this rat race where you keep saying, mine is bigger than yours, and you have to prove that all the time. You have AMCs and you have EMIs to pay, and remember, not every bank is PNB, okay? <laughs> where they would say, give me a loan and leave me alone. Especially after having paid all our taxes to Modi 1 and all our savings to Modi 2. So what it actually is or what it seems may actually turn out to be this. All looks good on the front, but this is what it becomes. <laughs> So now, let's say, even after you have overcome the barrier of buying expensive equipment, you now have like wow equipment, and you do wow surgeries because you're all fellowship trained, but in retina, we all have heard of these terms, and this is usually our consolation. Patient has PVR or scar, vision does not improve, optic atrophy, macular ischemia, foveal atrophy, can't help it. So we have a special Snellens chart for retina surgeons, and it is this, hand movements. As long as they can see this, we are happy. That's why we say retina as just a speciality is always underappreciated. It is a thankless job because however good, if this is retina, the doctor, however good you may be, the patient will always look for a quickie, something that will give him instant gratification. More proof if you want of this, just look behind and you'll see that the turnout for a retina topic is far lesser than what you have in cataract, LASIK and so on. You see the other all, they'll be full. I is compartmentalized only for the doctor, not for the patient. We can tell the patient this is a different part of the eye, requires more effort, the results are not going to be as good. But the patients will always feel that this doctor has taken more time, has made me see less, perhaps he's not a good doctor. As if this all isn't enough, 100 khujli panis, if you see 100 routine patients, it will generate just one retina patient, similar to what, I, what, what I'm showing here. So there is what we call as a gross redundancy of equipment. You bought a whole lot of expensive equipment, and if you're going to see a very small footfall in terms of patients, you're going to have a lot of incurring costs of them. So what you do is you resort to your referral base, as what Dr. Dudani mentioned. You have good relations with all your anterior segment surgeons and tell them to refer more so that you get those select patients. And despite the fact that you may have rescued an anterior segment surgeon in the past, you can always be replaced by someone prettier. So you are probably, of the yesteryears, will always be replaced by someone more futuristic. So what you do as a desperate attempt, you start giving them doorstep service. Okay, fine, you do not send patients to me, I will come and visit you. And when you start doing that, this is what you land up with, usually in Mumbai. And if you try to take the easier way out, this is it's, it's still way too hard. Especially for doctors or anterior segment surgeons who have this, who suffer from this complex called Mera patient complex. Yani as if that patient's Aadhaar card is linked with that doctor's PAN card for the rest of his life. <laughs> If you have to visit that doctor that I'm not going to send you that patient, you're going to come and visit. You have to carry a lot of stuff even to their OTs if you want to do a retina surgery there. And you're overburdened with carrying your laser, your cryo, your vitrectomy, all that surgeon does not have. In the end, not accomplishing a very, sh uh, a, a very decent job. So if you're all about retina, 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 you'll start tilting towards Okay, fine, let me do a few cataracts. Retina, retina, cataract. You'll go on to, okay, fine. Retina, LASIK, cataract. 
and then obviously you'll feel satisfied, go on to, okay, I'll add glaucoma, I'll add squint orbit, maybe even appendix hernia. Okay. That's a little <laughs> bit too exaggerated. So let's restrict ourselves to retinal ASIC cataract. Let us put this model to test. So now you have wow equipment, you have wow surgery, you, though you have PVR scar, optic atrophy, macular ischemia, and foveal atrophy, you also have 6-6 six, six results, 6-6 six, six N6 six with multifocals, with LASIK you have 6-4 and 4 and that is when the patient will start believing, wow, doctor is God. And if you feel that you were underappreciated at a re as a retina surgeon, if you incorporate cataract and LASIK in your practice, you have both. As what Dr. Abhishek says, bang for your buck, you have both in every sense of the word. So when you say eye is compartmentalized only for the doctor, not for the patient, you can always tell the patient we have all treatments available under one roof. And if you feel that you have a lot of redundancy, you have a lot of patients to actually screen before you land up with a retina patient, the footfall will increase with the comprehensive workload that you have. From an empty OPD, it will be far busier. As far as referral base is concerned, cataract surgeons that were initially referring you retina, if you have decent relations with them, they will also bring their LASIK to you. They cannot have a LASIK machine onto themselves. They will always look for a center. And if you are having a comfortable relationship with them, they probably bring LASIK as well. They will also bring squint plasty and anything that requires general anesthesia or high risk cases. If you have a center that caters to those, provided you share your cataracts. You let them come over to your center or send your cataracts over to them so that their bread and butter is also met. Because cause in the end, we have just two hands, two legs, 24 hours in a day, and just one life. We cannot reach everywhere. So instead of just being able to rescue someone else, let us rescue each other. And instead of saying, mine is bigger than yours, as far as equipment costs are concerned, you pool in, you have a team of referring doctors who are going to pool in money with you and then you're going to say ours is way bigger than yours. So from a specialist, you're going to become a specialty institute. The specialty institute works on this principle, the jam does not taste good if it is not accompanied with bread and butter. So you need your basics in order to be a specialist. A specialty institute, as I said, if you want job satisfaction, if you want to be a specialist of the seventh layer of the retina, you can simultaneously have another specialist who's a specialist in the seventh order aberration of the cornea. So when I say you should rather be a jack of all trades or a comprehensive ophthalmologist, I would rather be that you become not the master of one, but the master of all. Thank you. This last slide is uh, a flyer for our annual meeting in uh, August, Bombay Ophthalmic Association. I am the new secretary that will be taking term, so I invite you all. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel, for a wonderful presentation. I uh, really think all of us enjoyed it. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Rajiv Jain now for uh, his talk on perspectives on visibility and branding, uh, how to make a mark on the market. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, well, I'm not a marketing guru or someone. Uh, I thought I'll just uh, put my perspective, what helped me in my practice. So uh, we all must understand that our branding is different from other brandings. We are not branding for a television or a car. Like, uh, you can't tell your patient that we have given you good service, kindly visit us for your next retinal detachment. So it looks very odd, although we all would like to do so and <laughs> tell our patients to come to us if you feel happy about it. But we can't put a uh, bell on the door, uh, ring the bell if you feel happy. <laughs> so, yeah. So most important thing in uh, healthcare facility is treating your patients with sensitivity and empathy. And my whole talk is uh, regarding this only. I think there's some problems, some overlapping because of uh, change in the system. So uh, we must understand that uh, 
branding and marketing, when once we're talking about healthcare branding and marketing, it is way different from uh, the uh, way other brands or other like cars or television uh, companies, they uh, market or brand themselves. And here we are dealing with the uh, people who have, yeah, this is better, thank you. So what we need to do, we need to have uh, design your brand. And once we talk about brand, brand cannot, you, ca you cannot have uh, happy patients unless uh, you have good doctors at your place. You cannot have uh, satisfied patients unless uh, uh, you have a friendly layout. And uh, what we say and how we behave in our center, that serves, uh, that, that helps a lot in bringing your brand and uh, show your quality and your empathy to your patients. So as I'll always say, facility design, I think, uh, uh, Abhishek has covered facility design has to be good so that it is soothing and comforting to the patients. You cannot have uh, uh, bad toilets, uh, littered uh, tissue papers everywhere in the facility and then you expect patients to think very high of you. And this is the concept of internal branding. See, one way is bringing the patient into your facility. The other thing is whoever comes to your place is actually a brand ambassador of your place. You give him good services you treat him well, you empathize with that patient, and that patient, when he goes out, he speaks a lot about your center, uh, your hospital, and helps in bringing out the patient. I'll come to that also. So uh, how do you implement the experience of the patients who are there already inside the hospital? <coughs> you need technology, you need uh, the right partners, and you need a good web designer. When I say right partners, right partners in the sense who can train your staff, who can train you, to uh, uh, manage the flow, patient flow, and uh, the patients who are already inside. You cannot have uh, untrained staff who don't know how to put the drops, uh, make every time they touch the patient, the patient is uncomfortable. Every time they ask the patient to write something, the patient is, uh, uh, it's, the patient don't understand what your uh, OPD assistant is asking for. Great ambience I, and great communication will always refer to genuine empathy and care. Just remember this, empathy and genuine care has to be there. No matter if you have five star facilities, but if you don't empathize with your patients, uh, patient won't come again. So new rules for hospital marketing is you have to prioritize your social media, increase your content marketing, and invest in community health. So first step is get a responsive website. Whenever I, I uh, as a doctor, my father needed a uh, urologist opinion, although I knew few urologists, but I always uh, look at their uh, profile. I always go to the web website, look for their profile, look what are their degrees. So you need to have a very good website, especially showcasing uh, your center, the doctors who are coming there, their qualifications, and what all things you do. And uh, you have to use your social media well. We are not. As doctors, we may not be very good in using the social media, especially the Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I've seen a lot, lot many patients who are putting uh, their, a uh, lot many doctors who are putting their surgeries on YouTube. So once uh, someone, a patient, you tell them that you have got retinal detachment, the patient goes Google, he puts retinal detachment. He doesn't put the doctor, he first puts the retinal detachment. And then a lot of things come. Once, uh, and if there is a name, Dr. XYZ, whom I visited, his video is there on uh, YouTube, or his name is there on Google, and uh, uh, his article is there on Google, where I can find it. They, they are really impressed. So they want to come to you after seeing it. And search engine optimization, I'm not sure how many of us know about it. And uh, for everything we type, uh, let's say, uh, best retina surgeon in uh, Delhi or Mumbai, so uh, search engine optimization, what it does is, uh, whenever there is a keyword like best retina surgeon in Mumbai, if someone has uh, hired a consultant who uh, works in software, your name comes first or second. You want your name to be on the first page as soon as some, any keyword like retinal detachment, macular hole surgery, or maybe uh, cataract surgery, FACO, MICS, IOL, multifocal lens. So for this, you have to invest. You need a consultant who works with SEOs, and uh, you have to pay for that, but I think it's worth. And uh, internal marketing, as I said, every employee of your hospital is your spokesman. So the way they treat the patient and the way they go outside and talk about you uh, tells a lot about your hospital. 
and as I said, give them, give them care. They'll speak for you. And important thing is how many of us, we actually collect this data. The, when the patient comes during the registration, we need to have their mobile number, we need to have their email ID so that we can shoot emails telling them about the new developments which are happening at our center. And uh, testimonials on the website have to be posted. I know uh, it's a tedious job, but it has to be done. Employ someone who can do all this, center manager or center coordinator, whoever is there, if the patient is happy, take their testimonials, uh, take consent in uh, written and put it on your website. Automate your operations. You, uh, the future is a lot of centers are doing it and uh, you want your uh, prescription to be available online to the patient just in case he uh, loses it and he wants another prescription for the glasses or for the medication, it should be available online. So that's the future. Well, with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, any questions? Okay. Now, I uh, invite Dr. Sachin Mauli. Uh, he's come from all the way from Belgao, and he's going to talk to us about uh, whenever you start, uh, whenever you start a new practice, you have a lot of uh, babudam worries, and how do you uh, go about them? How do you sort them out? He's going to let us know. Uh, good afternoon. I thank Abhishek for this opportunity. <coughs> well, apart from, uh, this is the most important thing when you start your practice. Uh, you need to know the law of the country. You need to know what all license you need to take uh, before starting the practice. Apart from the home license from your wife, of course, the most important would be uh, to get all these licenses. Now, I, I have divided my talk into uh, <coughs> say like building and premises related, environment like pollution control board related, it next one is healthcare related, finance related, labor law related, and if you have a pharmacy, of course, what licenses we need to take for pharmacy related. Now, regarding building, most important thing we sh when you are you're taking a building for rent or you're constructing on your own, most important thing what everyone would ask is a completion certificate of a building a license that uh, the municipality has allowed you to build it there. It's very important because if somebody complains against you, uh, you know, your, your hospital can be locked. For this small, uh, you know, it doesn't take much time to get this done. If it is a rented premises, it's most important to take, uh, you know, from your owner a completion certificate because of this, if you're invested heavy on the interiors, if the hospital is locked down because of these um, licenses, then you'll be in a big problem. So if they don't have CCs, in some cities getting a CC completion certificate is very difficult. At, at least a tax paid receipt to the municipality from your owner is most important. Okay? Fire NOC is depart, uh, fire NOC is important if your building is very high, I mean it's more than 15 feet, then you need to take a fire NOC. And electrical board, if you're having a generator more than 15 kV, uh, then you need to take a permission from the your electrical board to keep a generator in your premises. Then th you should have a contract for your lift, elevator, and licenses and MOU signed with all these people. Okay, these are building related problems and these are few things which you need to chalk down before starting your practice. Second most important I feel is taking, uh, having a tie up for your biomedical waste disposal. Well, as a retina surgeon or at, as an ophthal surgeon, you will not have much of biomedical waste, but it is a mandatory for every clinic to have a biomedical waste tie up with the private uh, establishments which you'll find in your cities, you know. There'll be a group of doctors who would be uh, providing you how to dispose of the biomedical waste. You need to have a tie up with them, sign an MOU, keep it in your clinic, and apply for a pollution control board, take a certificate for them, and all these are very important. You need to display how you are going to dispose your biomedical waste in your clinic. Like, you know, how you are disposing your shops, how you are disposing your, uh, uh, you know, uh, infected materials, and all those dry waste and all those. You need to segregate properly and, you know, take, take all this. Now, third important, now why I'm coming for this as a third is, this, is, yeah. this comes later on. Once you, once you finalize starting a practice, first is a building, then is the pollution control, then is your healthcare, like you know, you should of course have a MCI uh, 
uh, state body registration if you are a doctor, you should always enroll with the DHO, District Health Authority. You should have your clinic registered with them. It's most important, you know, because you are governed under something called Clinical Establishment Act in each state. Each state will have their own uh, different acts. We had a lot of problems in, la in Karnataka last time. We did a lot of strikes. We did, and you must have heard in news, like, you know, we had to fight against these acts. So registration is very important uh, with the DHO it's, uh, uh, because you are governed under these acts. <coughs> if you have a society or you are an NGO, you are doing free service, uh, or you have a trust wherein you are parallelly running a free uh, retinal surgeries or lasers, whatever, you need to register an NGO or you need to register your trust with the uh, government. You know? Nowadays, recently, off late trade license in many states is not required to be taken unless you have a pharmacy in your premises. Trade license for a clinic is not required in most of the states. Please check with your state where you are practicing in. In Karnataka and Maharashtra, they have removed it. Trade license is not required. Now, regarding finance related uh, licenses, what you need to take during your uh, uh, starting of practices, get a pan of your hospital done, then a tan of your hospital done. Tan is basically important when you're deducting TDS for like, you know, you call an anesthetist, you pay him some money, and you know, you need to uh, deduct his tax, deduct 10% of his TDS. Now the deducted 10% had to be paid to the government as well. So that is why TAN is required. In case you are an NGO, you need to apply for 12A and ATG. 12A and ATG are basically asking for a tax exemption uh, for your trust, for services, what you are doing, collecting uh, donations and all that. Now this is, this is off late change in 2000 last, uh, last uh, uh, budget. They have changed some certain rules in this. But luckily, healthcare, they have not still uh, put it as a taxable, uh, this thing you can still. And if you have a foreign funding, like you have write a project for a, uh, you know, a diabetic retinopathy project or something, if the fund comes from a foreign, then you need to apply for FCRA. That is, f this is the funding is regulated by uh, this act, you know. This is very important. For this, it takes a lot of time, a lot of hard work to get this FCRA done. It takes around six months uh, to get this license. So when you're planning a, project with international donors, so you need to get this done, okay? Of course, how you should need to have, a, your hospital should have an import-export license if you're getting uh, machineries from, uh, you know, all these uh, multinational companies to import directly on your name. Now, in this era, GST, few slides on GST, doctor services, hospital charges, nursing charges, all are exempted from GST. You don't, to you don't have to apply for GST under this. But whatever you purchase from pharma, for, for pharma or the company like IOLs, vi vitrectomy packs, medicines, consumables, all are GST applicable. Okay, so henceforth, since GST has come, retina surgeon look into his packages because when you are charging, say, around 40,000 for a vitrec vitrectomy, for including everything, you give him the consumables, you give him medical services, you give him your surgical, surgical charges, please rethink, because you're going to lose a lot on this. <coughs> of late, what we have started doing, what I have learned from these finances is, like, you know, build the consumables directly to the patient from the pharma. That means you all should have a tie-up with the pharma wherein you purchase all your consumables there and bill it directly to the patient's name. So you'll save a lot of, you know, uh, these things on that. You will be charging only on the uh, services, OT charges, nursing charges, and other things. So GST, you know, once GST is paid, you, must, you should also know that it is, you can claim a refund if you are GST registered. If you have your own pharmacy, then you need to register with the GST. If you have rented premises of your hospital, you will be paying GST on it, right? So it is wise to have your own pharmacy or a tie-up with the pharmacy wherein you can a ask for a GST refund later on. Now, uh, this, is, this is very important. As a doctor, nobody would teach you what are labor laws. As an entrepreneur in healthcare, you first thing I think you should know is some things, basic things about labor laws, because there will be a lot of harassment from this department if you are not aware. If you have more than 20 employees in your hospital, then you need to have a ESI, PF done, registration, then you, sh you should have those license number from the ESI, employee insurance scheme, and the PF, provident fund scheme. You should have a 
well, uh, this is regarding the 20 and more employees. If you still don't have 20 and more employees, then this is this is applicable to every institute. You know, you should have a child labor child labor declaration. You should have a daily wages registry. You should have a sexual harassment registry. Are you really aware of all these things? I mean, I was not unless a labor officer came to my clinic and asked for all this. That too, after three years of my practice. Now, these things are very important because unnecessarily you land up in a problem wherein they will ask you money, they will they will unnecessarily grill you. You know, all those things can be um, uh, thought of. You know, medical services are coming under now Minimum Wages Act. You should know this because if Minimum Wages Act is implicable, uh, Aya or a mousy who is or a as a helper who is working in your OT will be under this and he'll be getting something like 16,000 per month minimum. So think, think, think again uh, before, you know, uh, getting into all this and, you know, how to plan your income based on this. Pharmacy, of course, you have a pharmacy, you can have a trade license, you need to uh, register with a, a district drug authority, uh, you get a GST number, TAN and PAN, of course, because your accounts also will be online that time. Some important tips is like, you know, especially when you're dealing with these government offices, don't offer them bribe directly, pleading you guilty unnecessarily because you've not done anything. Uh, you know your facts right properly, you know, what you need to do and what is your rights. Please read some, some, some related to law which is required for the hospital practice. So if you start bribe, asking them for bribe, please, mera kaam kar do sab, take, take 10 rupees and finish my work, no, why you waste? If you start doing this, Everything will start on this. Everything will, you know, end up, you need to start. Uh, okay, let's, l quickly I'll finish this now. This is the most important, uh, the, you know, health schemes, TPS and insurance. A lot of things are coming cashless now. In this era, there will be a lot of government schemes which are coming up for the, for the populistic major because government wants to cover your health. I have divided this into like, you know, state government schemes, private insurances, corporate tie-ups. ECHS, CGS, like, you know, government, uh, central government things, and ESI. Each slide on these, you know, this is what you would like to have in your hospital, all these types, but is it really worth? Do you need all this? In India, still 70% of the population is uninsured. They, are, they don't have any health insurance, okay? Just because to beat the competition, do you need to get this? If you are a private practitioner starting very early, think again before uh, getting empaneled with all these. Why I say this is, just check the facts. There's a reality check you need to do. If you earn 100 rupees, you know, 60 rupees goes in. Can I have two minutes? Yeah. Yeah. If you earn 100 rupees, 60 rupees goes in expenditure, like paying your bank interest, consumable salaries, operational expenditures. 40% is a profit what you declare, out of which 30% you pay tax, that is 12 rupees goes in tax. 70% goes like, you know, in AMC or keep as a buffer to buy new machines or upgrade yourself or this goes like this and what, what will be left with you is only maybe a 15 rupees and 100 rupees what is your take home, tax paid money after this. There are a lot of things, I'm not, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic when you start a healthcare because a lot of things you need to work on these and uh, you know, you can do save money more than 15 rupees but you should work on all the systems where probably you can reduce this that in that 60 rupees where you have to uh, repay your banks and you should have a capital, create a capital, pay less interest and all that. Okay, this is, what I would like to drive a point is if you are doing more than 30% of your business, 30% of your business if you are doing on a cashless basis, that is on insurance, this thing, rethink because it will not be sustainable in the long run. You will be passing that burden to your future, you know. So if you are an initial practitioner, if you are not practicing as a big institute, 30% or more of your turnover should be, uh, should not be on these TPAs and health insurances because 70% at least is required for a, as a cash flow in the hospital because daily expenditures, there are so many things, unseen expenditures, so you need to keep this target as a 30% when you start your practice and not more than that. So when you start these health insurance related schemes, no basic things, you should have a separate manpower for it, you should have a lot of displays, have printing work, too many consents, all these you should have a separate patient counselors for this, you know. Uh, you should have enough capital to run the show on this, you know, because unless, because the payment comes once in six months or in a year when the government schemes are being enrolled. 
Now, these are a few advantages and disadvantages of having these government schemes. You'll get enough workload, but there's a lot of harassment, bribery, bribery, irregular. This is a part, I mean, this is a fact. I don't want to sound pessimistic, but this happens in India. Uh, uh, you know, but, but the positive points are also there. I mean, there will be enough workload for you. If there's a good publicity send that you have this scheme. A lot of patients will walk in, but you should really know what you're doing. Because most of these schemes are populistic. They are not pro-doctors. Because we have a very, very poor representation from our, uh, our end in the government to convince them these are the charges we need to run the show. Unless we do that, unless a body like AIOS or state authorities enter and say, you know, this is what this surgery costs, apart from the lenses or vitrectomy packs or whatever is there. There is there's very, very poor representation from our society. Let us accept that. Whatever the government fixes rate is final for us. 12,000 for a vitrectomy is the rate which is fixed in CGHS. Can you actually believe it? Is it possible to run a, do a vitrectomy? I think most of, most of retina surgeons would not even, uh, you know, uh, think of this. Okay, these are private insurances are sl slightly better, you know, it's cashless for the patient, the payments are quicker, for you are the cash flow is much better. Only disadvantage is you need to keep tracking these payments unless you have a person to do that, it's very difficult, sometimes you get lose, you get lost, I mean, they will not be able to um, sort of track the payments whether they have released it or not. There are fixed amount for each procedures in the insurance companies, that is one hassle wherein they are not all procedures are covered. Most of them, you know. Uh, other good part in this is there are co-payments allowed in these private insurance companies. Like, you know, if the patient wants to go for a higher package, they can definitely pay more from their pocket and claim the other things from the insurance. Corporate types are also good if you have a lot of corporate houses in the city, like you have, um, you know, for example, you have a, uh, some software company like Infosys or some com some factories you have, you have a tie-up with them for their for their employees. This is quite good. I think one should work on this, even though it is difficult to convince them that you are the best in the city, but if you can do that, it will be nothing like it. Like there will be some shipyard company or some, some mining company with 1,000, 2,000 employees. You can tie up their insurance with the family, uh, this thing. Uh, all these central government schemes are very good. They have become mostly online. There's absolutely no bribery or third man involved in this. The central government schemes, you should spend time to get enrolled and get empaneled in these things. Easy for retina practice because there will be multiple injections which you need to do. Most of these anti vegifs are covered in ECHS and CGHS schemes. So uh, it's very, very helpful. ESI, I would, I don't know, as a beginner of the practice, please don't get enrolled in these. There are a lot of patients. I, what I hear is, you know, the payments are due. There's a lot of scam going on. Uh, patient, the payments are not released for more than two years. As a beginner, I mean, these things are very difficult. If you're a big institute, fine, it might work for you. Well, this is, these are a few last slides. Be ready because you know, government is coming in with the universal health scheme for BPL, below poverty line people, wherein he is going, to, or wherein the government is going to uh, cover their health of some amount assured. Uh, so you have to be ready for all this. Uh, because uh, in this what will happen is they'll fix a rate for a particular procedure. You need to do uh, cashless for that patient in your hospital and then the government is going to pay, uh, pay you back. So for this, how you have to be ready is, we have to have a good representation in the government for pricing. When they fix the pricing, you know, our Prime Minister is coming up with a very big health scheme, very, very aggressive, uh, uh, you know, uh, health scheme is going to come. Why I'm saying this very, very, very affirmatively is, in India, there are more than 70% of the population in BPL, that is below poverty line. And these BPL, believe me, are given to anyone and everybody. Everybody go and can go and get a BPL card now. Ha, depends on your link. So for us, it's become it, it is going to be a big harassment because you won't don't you'll not see a cash paying patient in your clinic if this comes if this becomes reality. So how do we prepare for this? Is we need to work on the pricing. We need to tell our authorities be be a representative in the government for work on the pricing of these uh, packages. You know. Uh, well, this can create a lot of retina, retina referrals to you because if you have a lot of government hospitals without retina setup, then in a private, they are going to refer you. You will get good patients, but you need to work on the finances. So I don't want to sound pessimistic. If you want to be a health, health uh, entrepreneur, you need to work on all these, know the facts before in hand, 
you know whether you want these tie ups whether you want to you know uh, work with work like this or you're happy taking cash and you know at the end of the day you have some financial balance sheet by the end of this six months so these are very very important things uh, how much patient load you can cater to how much infrastructure you can cre uh, create to um, give the services create enough capital as a beginner your your thought process should work on that you know you need to create capital not only keep upgrading once you buy the best of machines take a breath wait for some time once you start your capital building then probably think of an expansion thank you very much thank you dr sachin that was a excellent presentation i think uh, all of us learned quite a bit from that uh, i'd request the audience to, uh, we can take questions right now uh, if there if somebody has is is there any medical legal advisor for example now is uh, now is the time where patients can sue even for the smallest possible problem so is there any medical legal advisor firm or medical legal advisors connected to each private practitioner overall who can help uh, you uh, help us at the times of trouble Uh, there are many doctors who have formed these firms actually they are may not be ophthalmologists but doctors themselves have learned law i know a couple of people i can share the contacts later on but uh, they are people who are actually practicing medical legal cases the doctors who understand our problem they have studied law and become a medical legal expert uh, there are there are many like this and you, you need to find out in your locality who they are and probably have a tie up or maybe an understanding with them whenever you have a problem they do definitely help I think uh, so. Uh, there are certain law firms also that have a medical, uh, medical legal cell in which they will take care of everything. They would take the documents from you. They would uh, reply to the summons. They would reply to the queries. Uh, they will fix up uh, the uh, hearings. Everything they take care of. And there are some of these legal firms actually uh, you, you can take a subscription for a very. It's a very small amount, but. Uh, uh, they take care of all the legal hassles that you can possibly have not only uh, as far as medical legal cases are concerned but also if you have trouble with your municipality for certain permissions or with the government for certain uh, permissions they take care of that also so is this something like medical protection society scheme like overseas there's a place i, I used to work in hong kong i lived there for 19 years and i was working with university so we used to have a medical protection protection society if there's any problem we just go and talk to them and they will help us sort out the matters and uh, uh, like you know uh, no, these are, these are private firms is this something like that no these are private firms you have to hire the services okay so in in mumbai we have this association of medical consultants it's abbreviated as amc it is a group of doctors again and they have their own indemnity issuing so if you take their indemnity uh, bond they will protect you and they will protect you really well because they will have to pay if they don't protect you so they are doctors and they do look at everything from a medical perspective which is more doctor friendly so uh, what dr somil said uh, i am from amc i am from mumbai and one of your committee member from Association of Medical Consultant. We have spread the things. Uh, we are trying to cover up many states where we can help the doctors and all. I'm into the medical legal cell and uh, health and accident. Uh, I do not know what about this state, whether we have uh, uh, Association of Medical Consultant approach over here. I'm just a little uh, doubt about that. But many states, uh, we are going and trying to help them out. Now, what my point is, you are from which state? Where are you practicing from? From Ahmedabad. I think we have already got a AMC over there, as we have medical consultant, and we have got a medical legal sale also over there. So what we have done, we have got a uh, uh, panel of uh, some advocates over there. So we take a help of them. So you don't need to go to the individual advocates. You go to the AMC, you just talk to them, and they will try to help you out with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more thing. Uh, uh, private practitioners, they should all join the IMA. So the IMA has got a wonderful scheme called PPLS's uh, uh, security scheme. And it's all a one-time payment. You just pay one time and you, you are uh, free to practice. And in case you have any, you need any sort of protection, the IMA is 
willing more than to help their legal representation and lawyers and even you get even the compensation will be covered okay. Correct. and you can even get your nursing home or a hospital registered with, with another PPL or system extend the coverage to your hospital as well. Correct. I think Karnataka has, IMA has started their own legal uh, this thing also. So this is a good thing. I mean, every state IMA should have their legal uh, cell as a legal. Uh. I thank all the speakers and the attendees uh, who have attended this course. Uh, I hope it was useful to you. And if uh, any of you have queries, we can take it now. We hand over the hall to the next session. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.